Bodylogic Physiotherapy, empowering people to achieve better health. Posture seems to be mentioned um, in certain categories. So you have a category where people are wanting to talk about posture because they're worried about protecting their spine. They say, well, I know that I need to sit up straight, so I know that that shows that I'm strong, or I know that I have to pull my, my core muscles on whilst I'm sitting or whilst I'm doing these exercises. And so, yeah, they're just, they're just relaying back to me the things that they think are common knowledge and that they, they certainly are surprised when perhaps I, I maybe take them down a, a journey of discussing where they, those beliefs came from and whether we understand the research behind those beliefs. Welcome back to another episode of the Empowered Beyond Pain podcast, proudly brought to you by Bodylogic Physiotherapy. In this podcast, we bring evidence to your eardrums to help translate research knowledge into real life. This week, we have another cracker episode covering all things posture and pain. So get ready, sit up straight. Or wait, no, maybe that might not actually be that important, either for preventing or treating back and neck pain. As you hear in this conversation, there are many widespread misconceptions when it comes to posture. Sit up straight, don't slouch, don't round your back. These are all beliefs that I myself and the guests on today's podcast also used to hold. It wasn't until we started researching posture and pain that we started to realize that those beliefs might not be that accurate or helpful. So sit comfortably, which may be different to someone else's comfortably, and enjoy the conversation. We initially had planned on only one episode on this topic, but because it's such a big topic and we spoke to a variety of different researchers as well as a patient voice, we decided to split it into two episodes, an A and a B. This week, Professor Peter O'Sullivan and I chat to Diane Slater and Kieran O'Sullivan, who have both recently been working and researching at the Aspatar Sports Spine Centre in Qatar. We talk about posture myths, facts, posture correctors, and a research paper that Diane led conveying seven surprising facts about posture. We created an infographic for that paper, which can be found, as well as the supporting references from the studies discussed today at www.bodylogic.physio forward slash podcast. In the next episode, Posture Part B, we're speaking to patient voice Joe from episode 14 again as well as to Nick Saracini, a physiotherapist and PhD researcher from Curtin University, whose entire project is on lifting posture and back pain. We'll kick off today's episode by hearing fact six from the 10 facts every person should know about back pain scientific paper, presented by patient voice, Michelle. Back pain is not caused by poor posture. How we sit, stand and bend has not been shown to cause back pain, even though these activities may be painful. A variety of postures are healthy for the back, and it's safe to relax during everyday tasks such as sitting, bending, and lifting with a round back. In fact, it can be more efficient. Thanks for your continued support and kind words. Pertu, a chiropractor from Finland, said he can't recommend the podcast enough. He especially loves episode 11 and thinks all healthcare professionals should listen. Thanks, Pertu. Sharing the podcast with your networks is the best way you can help make this information common knowledge. So please share away and tag us at EBP Podcast on the socials, and together we can make contemporary pain knowledge go viral. But for now, keep on asking, is there more to pain than damage? Welcome to the podcast, guys. We're very lucky to have, well, three researchers uh, and clinicians that work with uh, work in this low back pain space, and particularly we're interested today in the posture story. So we're joined here with Diane Slater and Kieran O'Sullivan, who isn't related to Peter O'Sullivan, um, but not, you know, we know <laughs> not that we know of, but they're big names in themselves, and we could have, probably have a podcast episode with themselves, and maybe we will in the future. Um, but I'd love for you just to quickly introduce yourselves and who you are and what you do. Um, maybe we'll start with you, Diane. Hi, thanks for having me. So I've been working with Kieran um, at Aspatar in the Sports Science Centre, and that's how we started to um, to work together. So my background is um, as a sports physiotherapist, working with lots of different team sports and individual sports, and then I've also did some work with the British military as a civilian, not as a not as a, a member of the military, and um, so just a very general um, MSK physiotherapy background. Awesome. And Kieran? So um, 
I trained as a physiotherapist in Ireland and uh, worked in clinical practice. And over the years, I developed an interest in back pain, partly as a physio, but partly because I had quite a bit of back pain myself and with hindsight, managed to make lots of mistakes in terms of you know, what I was trying to do to um, help that. And one of the things I spent a lot of time thinking about was the way I sat and the way I bent and how I activated my postural muscles. Um, and over time, I guess, through working with people like Peter and reading some of the evidence, I've come to look at that quite differently. Um, like that, I worked with Dan for a couple of years in the Middle East. Um, and now after topping up my bronzed Irish complexion, I'm back in the sunny southwest of Ireland. Yeah, cool. And well, maybe we'll explore that kind of lived experience and that history of that posture research uh, a little bit in the podcast today. I'd, I'd love to start with, so you, you two and um, Peter as well, were involved in a, a viewpoint in the JOSPT. Um, titled Sit Up Straight, Time to Reevaluate. Um, Diane, you led that paper and, and Kieran, you were the senior author on that. Diane, what were the motivations for that, for that paper? As a clinician talking to patients about posture, I was surprised really that the, the conversation wasn't really changing over the years. So the way that I would um, perhaps offer advice had changed, like following the, the literature that was coming out and I certainly have evolved an awful lot as a physiotherapist going from being a very um, much a manual therapist and giving postural advice in the past about sitting up straight and then but the conversations that the, the patients were, were directing um, me to have with them was much more around these beliefs that the beliefs seemed quite stubborn um, and didn't seem to be changing with, um, with perhaps the viewpoint that all of us in this conversation maybe now have and I wanted to sort of explore a little bit about why those beliefs of the patients were changing and and maybe what was happening in the wider profession as well. So, so what are some of the common beliefs that patients come with us that uh, maybe aren't as evidence-based or as um, contemporary as, as they perhaps should be? From my experience, posture seems to be mentioned um, in certain categories. So you have a category where people are wanting to talk about posture because they're worried about protecting their spine. So they think that they have this um, particular way that they must sit um, in order to keep themselves safe. And actually when people start to talk about it with me, they seem to mention it in a way, of course, I'm going to agree. Like they'll say, of course, my posture is bad. And of course, my posture is, you know, I know it should be better, but and they're coming at it from an angle of safety and protecting their spine. I think another group of people tend to talk about posture beliefs around the, the image that it presents to other people. And they're not so concerned about the safety side of that. So maybe their beliefs are much more around their body image as opposed to around the, um, the protection of the, of the spine. So this idea that they're sort of being lazy or they're not, um, you know, engaged or attentive. Yes, yes. Yeah. And they will often um, feed back, you know, things that they've heard, whether it's in the media or from other healthcare professions or from um, the exercise professions, um, the where they say, well, I know that I need to sit up straight. or I know that that shows that I'm strong or I know that I have to pull my, my core muscles on whilst I'm sitting or whilst I'm doing these exercises. And so, yeah, they're just, they're just relaying back to me the things that they think are common knowledge and that they, they certainly are surprised when perhaps I, I maybe take them down a, a journey of discussing where they, those beliefs came from and whether we understand the research behind those beliefs. So can you talk about the research behind those beliefs? I think, um, you know, the, it's such a, such a common thing and, and people are often quite sort of astounded when we're, we, we kind of talk about, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to slouch if that's more comfortable for you and you don't need to maintain this, you know, quote unquote, perfect posture all the time. Um, so, you know, they're, they're often quite surprising things. So what, what does the research tell us around, around posture and is, is there such thing as a correct posture? The research is, is quite surprising, and I remember as a certainly as a more junior physio, definitely um, you know telling people that I believed that there was a correct um, way to sit or a, a correct way to hold our posture. But I think perhaps um, Kieran and Pete would be best to, place to discuss their their journey through the, the posture research because certainly they've been a, been a, um, around and evolved in it a bit longer than I have. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um. 
I'd, 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 um, I'd like to ask Dan what she means by saying that I've been around a lot longer than she has. <laughs> In the past. You look like it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just, um, this hairline is, is kind of, um, is not helping. So but, this uh, is a toupee. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, Peter is like uh, President Trump. He insists that that's his own hair. <laughs> yeah, but I don't claim tax on my hair products. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, I guess as they're looking at some of the, um, I suppose we, can, we won't get into all the weeds of our, around what the research does say. I think interestingly what the research, my reading of a lot of the research on posture is, isn't so much that it says it's unimportant, it's that we're emphasizing stuff, stuff that uh, we can't say with any consequence because for any tissue, you know, there is going to be an, an, um, an importance of how it's loaded. So if you were going to look at, you know, um, stress fractures and Achilles tendon up, but there any musculoskeletal complaint, the way it's loaded might be important, but we, start, we started off with a perspective that there is one right way or one safe and appropriate way to load it. Now, um, of course, there will always be extremes, but what the evidence has said very consistently over the years is that the beliefs we used to have around deportment and posture aren't really um, supported in terms of preventing or managing musculoskeletal pain. And historically, a lot of it is based around um, you know, attitudes around what was, um, you know, um, I suppose, beautiful or graceful or, you know, aesthetically pleasing and almost to do with, you know, being a suitably intellectual middle class person as opposed to somebody that might be seen as a manual laborer and, and you know, less socially desirable. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that as soon as I, if, especially if I'm giving a talk to members of the public in a room, if, as soon as I kind of introduce that, you know, maybe I've done my PhD on posture and back pain, or if I tell them I'm going to look at posture, almost without exception, everybody in the room will change the way they sit and assume a more upright posture. And that in itself just demonstrates how we have these perspectives around what's good posture. Now, again, I sometimes get asked uh, by people like, would you ever suggest to somebody to sit up straight? And the only examples I can come up with is that if you're going into an interview, sitting up straight is not going to help your back pain. And I don't know that it will help your job in any way. But unfortunately, we have certain stereotypes around what is what it means to be interested and, you know, a, a hardworking person. So if even though I am somebody who habitually slumps and I'm quite comfortably with comfortable with it, I think if I was going in for an important interview, I would almost feel pressured to sit upright and uh, because that projects an image of being interested. But again, unfortunately, they've all become mixed together that if you want to be beautiful, especially as a woman, you must sit upright. If you want to prevent back pain, you must sit upright. If you want to look like an eager beaver worker, you must sit upright. And they're all quite different things. So it's not that we're saying posture is irrelevant, but in the narrow frame or lens that we're looking at in terms of does it make you less likely to get pain? Not at all. And there are probably much more important things to look at in terms of beyond posture. And then if we are going to look at posture, we might want to think about, well, what do we do to support the knee and the shoulder? And in those parts of the body, it's never around rigidity and keeping it tense. It's around making it strong and having shock absorption and mobility and so on. So while we're on the topic of it, there's more important things than posture, do you want to just quickly talk about um, some of that sort of stuff just to give a bit of a more of a, a I guess, a rounded um, finish to that, that answer? Yeah, cool. So if we talk about It'll be the same aspects, but an awful lot of the people we see with persistent pain, it won't be triggered by, you know, uh, an individual postural incident. And so there's a whole series of things from, you know, psychological things like mood and anxiety and stress and social things such as what's going on in your life and your work pressures and family situations, lifestyle things such as your sleep and your activity patterns and, and varying combinations of these. You don't, even if you look at the pandemic we're living through, it's caused huge changes in people's lives. Some of those beneficial, maybe less commuting time, work-life balance pressures, but again, it's varied a lot. Uh, unfortunately, the way we've kind of um, developed uh, our view of back pain, it's that, yeah, I've seen this even in the media. There's been a load of advice in the media in Ireland around, now that you're working from home, here's what you need to do to prevent back pain. And it's around, make sure you have a desk and a chair that's appropriate and a a mouse rather than working on the, you know, the, uh, or sorry, um, rather than working on the keypad and all the rest. Mm. And while those things may have a place, it doesn't look like it's very important. And these articles almost never focus on, well, what it does, um, 
the fact that you might have been homeschooling your kids while trying to hold down a job and work from home and work remotely. And for me, if you're going to say to me from that period, from say March to June, for example, in Ireland, when it was, there was a bit of work required and homeschooling and, and all that kind of stuff, and you gave me the choice of which would you prefer? Would you prefer a mouse uh, to kind of reduce your risk of straining your wrist or somebody that can mind your kids for three hours so you can have uninterrupted work? I have no doubt in my mind which would be more beneficial for my musculoskeletal system. Yeah, sure. So it's kind of speaking to that whole uh, multifactorial, um, uh, I suppose, experience of pain and the factors that contribute to it. Now, I, I, I pick you've also had, you sort of touched on that you had a bit of a personal experience with, with some back pain and some posture beliefs. Can you talk us through those a little bit? Yeah, sure. Like, um, I suppose you could, you, to make the story short, I guess, like a lot of people who played sport, I developed some aches and pains. Um, and both of them in different ways probably reflect, you know, how you can have um, a musculoskeletal complaint and then for it to be handled suboptimally. So as a teenager, I developed recurrent shoulder dislocation, which I eventually ended up having surgery for. And the surgery was quite successful in that I, it stopped dislocating. Yet I developed and had persistent um, apprehension around it for quite a long period of time. And that protective response around my shoulder um, it took far too long to drop, which probably reflected my own anxiety and my own sense of protection. Um, and even though other people were, you know, aware of that, it was something that I struggled to um, kind of get on top of. But I did go back eventually playing sport. But that was almost where you could say there was an orthopedic trauma, you know, related to physical trauma and, and some psychological factors that were connected to that. But then separately to that, a couple of years later, I developed quite a bit of back pain and it had a big impact on my ability to play sport, which was a big part of my identity and what I was known for. And then because it was probably kind of resistant or recurrent and didn't fit any particular model, um, I spent a lot of time seeking help and support from it. And at that time, a lot of the advice would have been on one hand about the dangers of um, flexing and, and the importance of protecting the back. And then equally the desire to keep playing sport. So I ended up kind of jumping between, I kept irritating it through playing sport and yet wasn't really able to understand all the different things that were going on in my life. And with the benefit of hindsight and all the rest of that, I can now see that it happened at a period of time where, you know, I was doing my work as a physio where I wasn't really loving it because again, I didn't really understand I think what we were doing. Unlike a lot of the guys I played with, I hadn't progressed to the highest level of sport so my self-esteem and my confidence and my kind of sense of who I was was definitely challenged by all that. And, um, you know, there was just those same mix of factors we see in lots of people, the sense of not being in control of your pain and the unpredictable nature of the pain. And it was fact only after kind of working with people like Peter and gradually, first of all, understanding pain and also just getting to a better position in my life where sport wasn't as important, that, you know, the pain settled quite a bit. Um, and, you know, hindsight is everything, uh, but I do think we will still see a lot of people where they'll be in that situation where me, like a lot of people back then, my pain was treated uh, by me and by others as a, an injury, a tissue injury. Now, of course, there was some nociceptive input, probably, but the broader context of, about what the pain meant to me and what I was doing to do, it was probably a much bigger part of it than, than I would have been aware of at that time. And being honest, I think if somebody had approached me, you know, saying that at the time, I would probably have resisted it. Because for me back then, even though I was a physio and I'd heard about these biopsychosocial things, I probably had the perspective that that was for people who were pretending they weren't, you know, didn't want to get better or that maybe had really severe psychosocial factors where they were suicidal or dep so depressed that they were lying in bed all day. Whereas I think there's a large chunk of the population where their health of their life isn't optimum. And that just drags down the health overall. Yeah, sure. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a really relatable story as well. Um, and, and, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. And I think, you know, we, we're, we're all, um, you know, uh, there was a period of time where I would tell people and, and correct people on their posture and, um, you know, knowing the research and, and going through that journey, it's, it's kind of evolved now. And, and I think it's probably, um, you know, that's a nice segue into, where some of the research into the posture started that um, yourself and, and Pete were involved in, you know, the, the messages that we used to give or that we, the research findings used to um, talk about or used to 
yeah, re reveal uh, are different to what they are now. So um, uh, maybe Pete, Pete, yourself and, and Kieran can talk a little bit about the journey of, of how research has, has evolved. Well, it's interesting you say that, Kim, because I, I, my first thought about posture, I think the first time I really thought about posture, it wasn't discussed in my home. I don't think at all as, as a kid. I don't think I ever had any attention on my posture at all. My first day of physiotherapy school, we were all stripped. And I was like a pretty shy 18-year-old, left home, and I was stripped to my underwear in front of this group of about 46, mainly women. And I was pretty skinny and a not, you know, like a, probably a little bit underdeveloped at that stage. And and then we had photographs taken of our of ourselves. And mine was a side and side on photograph. And I was told what terrible posture I had. So that was my first introduction uh, to my physiotherapy training in New Zealand, Dunedin. And, and I think that kind of seeded this whole belief and was certainly a big part of uh, the training back then around the importance of posture. And that kind of was partly linked in too with a lot of the McKenzie approach back then that kind of created this horror story of the vulnerability of the disc. If you slouched or if you bent or if you had a round back or you sustain that for a period of time, you put this disc at risk and, you know, the nucleus pulposus would pop out the back and you could rupture your disc. And so there was this kind of catastrophic belief that was embedded around that time um, around posture. And so, you know, this idea that you need a lumbar roll when you sit and you have to keep the curvature and all that stuff was really powerfully embedded and kind of wrapped in this um, quite frightening <laughs> structural model of understanding pain. And, and I remember um, coming to Western Australia to do my postgraduate. And I, I must admit, as a clinician, um, it, it puzzled me because I'd see these patients who'd come in who would go, you know, can you, can you bend over? They go, no, I don't do that anymore. And you go, what? It's like, you know, because that's dangerous for me. So you could see how the, these messages create a lot of fear in people. Um, and then that kind of, um, some of Lance Tuvey's early work had really questioned a lot of that pathological model around uh, the cold disc story that um, was embedded in the McKinsey approach. And so it kind of created some of these seeds of doubt. Um, and it, it also at that time, you know, in that early, you know, they were early 90s um, to mid 90s when I was involved in early research, we were looking at EMG studies of people with pain and realized actually their muscles were really overactive. <laughs> and um, they weren't, you know, we had this picture of, you know, the back being with pain being vulnerable and unstable and you need to stabilize it with the core and your multifidus and your abdominal wall holding these neutral spine postures and we were seeing these patients who were coming in where they couldn't switch the bloody muscles off with uh, their postures were really rigid and guarded and and it kind of created this question mark around what was going on with posture and that kind of morphed into a whole series of posture studies, both at a population level, some of women dank its early research, looking at people with back pain and then people without back pain uh, and seeing that actually there's a variety of ways that people with pain hold themselves. Um, and, and I think the issue, the reason why it's so interesting for back pain is it is one of the most disabling things for people with back pain. We often presume that people with back pain have problems with activities, but actually sitting and standing are really commonly disabled, disabling things for people. So they are massive um, sources of disability. And I certainly have seen patients who literally won't sit down or people who've had a panic attack with, the, with attempts to sit down. They've been so disabled or people who literally wouldn't stand for any period of time. And, uh, you know, I've got a case at the moment who, who would be high, you know, almost develop an anxiety response just standing in one position. Um, and so it's kind of interesting when you start looking at human responses or people's behavioral responses to pain is that we've almost created, I think, a fear around the spine in posture. Uh, and this whole narrative that we've created, I think has become incredibly unhelpful uh, and is embedded in this disability, I think, um, that is linked to it. And certainly the, the research studies show that people when they, with back pain when they sit, don't sit relaxed. Uh, they might sit in a variety of positions, but often, if, particularly if they're really in pain, they're very guarded and protective around their posture. And that probably fits in with some of these things that... Um, that we've seen. And, and certainly if I throw that back to you, Karen, 
um, with your PhD, you looked quite a lot at posture uh, in a few different groups. And I wonder if you want to talk about some of your findings in, that, in those studies. Yeah, cool. Um, the thing that comes to mind when you're talking about that there, Pete, is that um, there's great value to seeing patients and working as a researcher. And I think it, you know, it leads to better research questions and, and there's many advantages. The one disadvantage I would feel when I look back in terms of my work, when I was working as a clinician, seeing patients working on their posture, what I used to see, you know, in my kind of a subjective sense was that I would have some people who were low risk, mild pain, and I would give them exceptionally complicated posture and core exercises, but you know what, they would do well. Yeah. So that confirmed my beliefs that that's what was key. And then I would see these other people who were very distressed, had a really tough time, really suffering. And I would give them these same exercises, which of, which of course were very complicated. They didn't mm -hmm. feel they had control over, they made them feel bad and then they would come in and I would lecture them on how bad they were or, you know, a variation of that. And then they would do poorly. But in my lens, it was well, the people who complied with my overly complicated exercises did well and the people who didn't, didn't do well. And, and it's only when you step out of some of that, you know, the clinical stuff is great, but it's only when you step out of that and you look at some of the trials and Peter mentioned the big population studies like the Wayne study done by Peter and Leon and those people. When you step back and look at the numbers, or even some of the other big population studies, it's very hard when you, to say that, you know, we're going down the right track with some of that very, very specific postural stuff. And that's what I saw in, in some of my own PhD work. Um, but I, what I think at the my own PhD work will say, what it did show me is that that doesn't mean postures are ir irrelevant completely. So we saw, same as with Wim Dankers, we saw some people where their pain is provoked by the way they move, and there are some characteristic ways of holding yourself. You can talk about different ways of doing it, where people unnecessarily and unhelpfully provoke their pain. And so even though we're all here saying, you know, posture is not what we were meant to believe. If you're pain-free, you should probably just not give it too much thought. But if you're in pain, it might be worth spending time just thinking about how you hold yourself. And, and we looked at a few things, looking at how people bend and using, there was a couple of different ways, using some postural biofeedback to see can we help them to move a bit, a bit better or even in other work with some students looking at how people sit on chairs. And we found, for example, that if you take things like saddle chairs where you're propped up and it makes you sit a bit more upright, um, on average, it makes no difference, but there will be people who feel much better on it and people who feel much worse on it. And so rather than having fixed ideas about this is what makes good posture, listen to the person, see what they're thinking about their back, see if there's ways they can feel more comfortable. And so I don't go around recommending that you must try a lumbar roll or you must try this chair. But if somebody has a lumbar roll and they're not a bit bothered by it, that's fine. You know, we're not going to be, there are bigger battles that we'll face. Um, and I think that's probably, I was probably slower to kind of appreciate some of those factors than somebody like Peter, for example, in terms of teasing out when it's worth looking at some technical um, stuff and, and, and movement stuff and when it isn't. And I think that's where some of that researching by probably other groups in terms of pain mechanisms has been useful. So like if this really does sound like a tissue strain, tissue injury, and it's, you know, aggravated and eased in a very predictable manner, well, then it might be okay to spend some time looking at your technique and all the rest of it. And those people do exist, but they are not the ones clogging the emergency departments and on long-term sick leave as far as I can see. And so for those people, we need to look at other strategies. And part of that, if we look at some of the stuff that has been done in behavior experiments, can be useful in terms of, it's a very powerful learning experience um, to show somebody how to move or sit or bend in a way that's less painful. Mm -hmm. Because, but that requires some physical, technical skills as a physio, but also a great ability to reassure people and make them feel confident. Cool. Thanks for that. That's uh, that was really nice, nicely described. Um, I want to kind of bring it back to some practical advice uh, just for the general population. You know, we've, we have listeners that are p people in pain, people that don't have pain, um, you know, physiotherapists and other health professionals as well. Uh, what what should we be advising people? Um, you know, in terms of their posture. Diane. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Take that ball. Um, I think I think to reiterate Kieran's point there that one size doesn't fit all. Um, that we're not going to say that the the posture isn't um, relevant. That for some people, obviously, it is. I think the main point that I find myself 
um, repeating uh, repeatedly saying to patients is more around um, the like are you comfortable in the way that you are sitting so just to you know it helps them to reflect on their own beliefs a little bit as well and and because often they'll say well actually you know I'm more comfortable when I sit slouched but I've been told I shouldn't do that and so just just getting people to reflect on on what their experience is in different positions and I think when people first of all just pay um, attention or have a bit more awareness around how they're doing something it, it allows them the opportunity to to reflect and, and perhaps to try and experiment with some different movements and some different positions so often what I find is people don't realize that they're always adopting a particular position so that might be the way that I talk to them mm. about posture so so I think helping people to to just to break to, to to have an awareness. We don't want them to become overly focused on on how they're they're sitting, but have an awareness and say, say well, okay, what feels more relaxed? And I think if there's one message that I would be sort of sending out um, generally, it would be about about being relaxed and and just what feels comfortable to them, rather than any hard and fast rules. Yeah, yeah, sure, that's great. The um. The thoughts that come to mind when I think about like the advice we give people, this partly is based on, I suppose, some of the, the challenges we've faced before. It's tricky to, um, we produced an infographic related to this paper, and while in one sense they're useful, if sometimes people just see a heading, if something is so contradictory to their beliefs, it, it can be easier for them to dismiss it. And so one of the challenges, one of the bits of feedback I've got, which I'm not sure how we change, is that there will be a lot of people out there who get pain bending forward. And when you see them in the clinic, the pain bending forward is likely related to the fact that they don't flex their back at all. Um, and they keep it bolt upright, and so they move very rigidly, and it's very sore. However, in their head, what's happening is they're getting pain from flexing too much. So their strategy is to be more and more and more careful. And when I say things to them, or when they read in a leaflet, bending is not dangerous. Uh, that makes no sense to them, mm. because their experience of bending is very, very tricky. And it's I don't know how we come up with a a paper-based infographic or paper that illustrates that. Now, there's probably ways in which if you had a nice animated video or, or actual video of showing different ways of doing it, you might be able to explain that. But there are, you know, as a society, I think we conflate flexion and bending and treat them as if they're the same thing and they and they almost certainly aren't. Yeah. The other Can I add on to that? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Just to add on to that, so similar to with, the, with the sitting, so um, people who are sort of saying, well, I have pain when I'm sitting so then if it, it's that relationship between pain and, and danger or whether if they're experiencing pain then the position must be dangerous and I think just to explore explore that not just the just the belief about the flexion but also what the pain means and um and just asking patients about where this threat comes from like how is sitting dangerous and and just allowing them to sort of just to explore that themselves is to say, well, if I'm sat here and I'm not moving, but I have pain, what does that actually mean? And and a lot of it's around their understanding of what the meaning of pain is. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess one of the things I've touched on with Dan before, Dan's worked in the military for quite a while, and you know, being upright in the military, that's actually you know almost an essential component, and and it's probably something worth teasing out. But one of the things I've tried to do with patients or in terms of talks is to kind of almost confront people at the start when they say, what's the right way to sit? To go back to that point of, well, for what? Is this to look good in a dress, to look impressive in an interview, to look attractive? Because that might require one approach. But if you're asking me about pain, that's a different thing altogether. Mm. Because, you know, it's, it's, I had a, a musician at one point who... Um, had a lot of pain and it was very strongly connected to stress anxiety but also a very very upright posture and I asked her to explore sitting in what I felt was a more relaxed position and when I asked her how she felt that was she the word she used was I think it's disrespectful and lazy you know and so like people's views of what the posture kind of says about them is important to be aware of as well because it, I could have told her that's a good position or a stretch but she was never going to engage with that if she felt that's how, how it was viewed by other people, I think. Yeah, I think the one thing I'd pick up on that too, Karen, is um, that what people perceive they look like and what they look like are different. And that's why taking a, a, a having a mirror or taking a photograph is can be such an important thing because they perceive that, you know, being slightly relaxed is being like a banana. 
uh, where actual fact they've just gone from a, you know, an over exaggerated upright position to a relaxed neutral position, but in their mind, they perceive something quite different. And so we know that when, when there is pain and anxiety, people's perception of their body can be quite distorted. Uh, and so we have to be very careful around, you know, presuming one thing, it, it may be that, it, that for say for a dancer, then a more relaxed posture actually isn't that, you know, something that would be recommended um, by the, by the, you know, dance instructor or whatever. But in other, in other situations, I've seen very frequently where people's perception of their body is different to what they actually look like. Uh, and so there's that whole element that does come into it too. It's a good point because, you know, in my mind, I look like a, pale, balding, middle-aged, wrinkly Irishman, but obviously it's nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I'll vouch for that. <laughs> With the military, um, when, when the guys are on parade, and obviously that would be a big thing that they would need to be to be stood in a, a particular position. And often uh, Pete's point about just getting them to relax and they think, well, no, I can't stand like that. I would get, I know I'd be called out for that. But if you just talk about them, just let, just letting go of their breath, just really relaxing their stomach, they, they feel that they look really slouched. And again, if you show them the photo, actually yeah. they, they, they realize that, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand out from the rest of the guys on parade if, I, if I'm doing this. Okay. And it is just that different and difference in perception. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing that's worth touching on, and this fits in with some of the um, data in your recent paper, Kev, is that a lot of the patients that we do see who have quite distressing back pain, a bit like the lifting story where people, when they have pain, start thinking more about their posture, I think. Um, and, and then they start holding postures that they think they should hold because the reason they got back pain was their posture was so terrible. And now that we've got it, they've got to try and prevent it getting worse by holding it very upright. So those powerful beliefs start kicking in. Uh, and, um, and so often, you know, what we see with a lot of these patients is they hold very tense and very upright postures that are actually quite uncomfortable and you know they're not dangerous in themselves but to hold we kind of use the analogy of clenching your fist if you do if you're right if you're writing a letter to someone and if you over clench your the pen you start getting writer's cramp and you have to stop uh you know there's nothing dangerous with clenching the pen when you're writing a letter but actually your ability to perform that task over a long period of time can be quite painful, but you're not damaging your wrist or your arm in the long run. But in the same way, if you are adopting that with it around your posture of your body, that you are holding these um, rigid or guarded postures for a long period of time, they can be quite painful, uh, not dangerous, <laughs> but very uncomfortable and fatiguing. Uh, and, and if the system is sensitive, then that could be provocative of their pain. And that's where, you know, working with a healthcare practitioner, to not just work within a posture paradigm, but to actually explore the patient's experience. Uh, and amongst all those other factors uh, is I think very important. And certainly in your, um, in your ser case series, Kev, mm. that was what you observed, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, just touching on that point as well, you know, tense muscles can hurt after a while. You tense the muscle for a long period of time and then it'll start hurting. Um, but yeah, certainly a, a, a large percentage of the patients in, in um, or the participants in, in my case series would hold these um, postures. They'd be quite upright. They'd sit tall. They'd pull their shoulders back. They'd be bracing through their core. And, and ironically, that's what that we know as good posture. But then as, um, as, as they got better, as they improved, their postures actually returned to more kind of quote unquote normal or more relaxed, more slouched um, positions. And that was both in sitting and standing. Um, so yeah, we can kind of see how these beliefs can really um, drive people into, into places that, that are not good, not, not nice. One of the, one of the challenges I think for people like us, cause you know, we're in our little um, bubble where we all agree with each mm. other. But one yeah. of the challenges I think is to, if we convince people that, this with this message that you know some of those outdated ideas about posture you don't need to worry too much about them there's a risk then that we get seen as saying that mechanical loading is irrelevant and of course that's not what we're saying but i'm sometimes struggling with how do you get across that again in a in an infographic or a short media interview because you know when you go into an, an occupational setting we can deconstruct some of the postural beliefs but then if you have the control, you can also say, no, if you're going to do anything about mechanical load of your back, don't worry so much about the angle, but just look at the volume and the magnitude of loading. So if you've gone from doing nothing 
and now you're going to be doing this physical loading can we can we build up your conditioning to be ready you know to do that and so but i'm not sure how we get that message across you know in a in the kind of the world we live in where it's a short snapshot yeah. infographic or animated video that we get across because we do want people like with the work that nick and dave nolan and those are doing to reduce some of the fears and the and the outdated notions about posture but also to understand that same as if you look at hamstring injuries or any tissue kind of condition building up load tolerance is important but unfortunately in all the ergonomic manual handling advice that i've seen it's well avoid all that load and be very careful yeah. and then hope for the best whereas what we're actually saying is well don't worry too much about that but build yourself up and prepare for it but that's a bit nuanced to try and get across in a in a simple yeah. heading and I suppose around that, we really need uh, more research to see whether a different narrative has an impact, an impact, because we know that the ergonomic interventions haven't haven't really had any influence, positive influence on pain. So we really are, are waiting for um, a different narrative to test whether we can have you know a, a positive impact. Because we know from a prevention point of view, it's actually very difficult to present, prevent back pain. There is some evidence around um, engaging in regular physical activity as being preventative or protective I mean, around pain episodes. But actually, as you said, there's probably a much broader story around you know people's risk of, of back pain and particularly disabling back pain uh, uh, being linked to a variety of factors around their general health and their sleep and their physical activity and their how sedentary they are and all of those things, which is just a, a bigger story, um, which I think needs to be told, but it's a harder sell. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, I don't think we'll say you can, you can take what we're saying and say we're, uh, that we want there to be no occupational health departments. We probably want them to focus on different yeah, things exactly. because if you look at the whole area of sick leave and, and having a, a middleman or middle person, yeah. in, you know, liaising between the employer and their staff member, it's important that somebody knows the context, knows the environment, but just changing the narrative there from the dangers of work to the opportunities work brings and how do we make sure you're able for it in a, in a graduated manner. Exactly. And it's almost like a, um, a health message rather than a, um, than a it's, it's like a, health, a model of health rather than a model of, of sickness, I think which is kind of like we've kind of created this model of danger and injury rather than saying, well, what's a model of health look like and how do we optimize that? And, and, you know, we, we of course are, are talking about it in our own kind of a physio MSK bubble, but even if you look at the pandemic, we've seen some of those same complicating factors in terms of asking people to avoid certain situations, but then they work in a situation where they won't get sick pay if they don't go to work. So, you know, if we really yeah. want to change behaviors, we have to make, we have to stop penalizing people for getting better. So if I have somebody with back pain and I think it would be good for them to go back to part-time work, then they shouldn't in a court or a medical insurance um, system be penalized for getting better. And they're all, they're all part of that message as well. Yeah, awesome. I want to bring it back finally to the, the paper and then ask one final question of, of us, of you guys. Um, and I just thought I'd quickly go through the infographic that we developed in terms of the, the seven facts. Now, this will be available in the show notes page, um, but I just want to quickly rattle through them so people have an idea of what they are. Number one is there's no single correct posture. Two is differences in postures are a fact of life. And we've discussed lots of these uh, in, in the chat today. Three, posture reflects beliefs and mood. Four, it's safe to adopt more comfortable postures. Five, the spine is robust and can be trusted. Six, sitting isn't dangerous. And seven, one size does not fit all. Um, we, we've touched on a lot of stuff today, which is, which is fantastic. Now, one of the most common um, things that comes up um, you know, in people's um, news feeds on online and for, you know, the uh, recommended posts and sponsored ads are posture correctors. So w what's the go with them? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of marketing around these and, and some of them will be now more sophisticated, high tech sensors and gyroscopes and so on. Again, uh, look, some of them have a business model and the business model is around selling lots of units. If you were going to say what's the evidence that any of them would prevent musculoskeletal pain, there is none. There is a separate argument as to whether we should even try to prevent MSK pain at all. You know, like some of this stuff is just normal aches and pains. Um, for me right now, I would take a lot of convincing uh, before I would be suggesting to any patient, here is this device and now you go and do it. Now, the, the real 
I suppose the best possible kind of change in that narrative would be um, the restore trial. And Peter can talk to that where there's a specific, you know, validated instrument that's being used as a form of feedback. But right now, when it comes to the Facebook ads and all the rest of it, I think there's lots of other things we could get the basic building blocks in place in terms of mobility, thoughts, work-life balance, sleep, physical activity, um, and any of those other adjuncts right now will be well down the track. But again, I'm open to be convinced by good data and we'll have some of that from Restore in 12 yeah. months or so. So look, we should have some of that information, yeah, 12 to 18 months. We will have an idea whether providing um, feedback around the body uh, actually enhances outcomes or not from our trial. So that'll be really interesting. Um, you know, from a personal position, um, I personally don't use any of any devices when I work with patients. And, and my, my, I suppose one of my concerns is that it creates a focus for the therapist and the patient around one dimension of their problem and not on the biggest, the biggest story of pain. And, and I think for a skilled practitioner, maybe that you could, like that would maybe okay, but I think there's just this greater descent. I think from my perspective, um, I'm happy when people don't have to think about their back. And I think this constant attention to the back creates a sort of a vigilance or a hyper focus, which in many cases could be quite unhelpful. Um, when do I say to people, when did you last think about your elbow? And they go, what? <laughs> like, yeah. So like, how much do you think about your back all the time? What do you think about? Oh, my posture and what I'm doing. When did you last think about your elbow? Well, I don't. Is it a problem? But if you had tennis elbow uh, and, you, and it's really sensitized, all you can think about is your elbow. Now, of course, sticking a you know, couple of sensors on your arm to look at where your elbow is going, you know, would that be helpful? So this idea of putting lots of attention on a body part that's in that maybe have pain uh, may not be in fact so helpful, but we'll have a lot more evidence around that from within our study. And, you know, that's why we do research is to explore these things so that we can, you know, not just have our own opinion, but actually have some good evidence to, um, to give us an idea. And it may be that for some people, they could respond really well to that and others it might really piss them off or may not be helpful and we'll have some idea of that as well. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we're, we're, certainly speaks a lot of about um, living in the grey from some of the conversations that we've had here and it's not, it's not all black and white. Um, Diane and, and Kieran, I'd love to thank you for your time. It's an awesome paper that you led, Diane. I, I refer lots of patients to it and the infographic is quite popular. Um, kind of going back onto what you were saying, Kieran, around um, people taking this uh, quick look at it, a quick glance at it, and we actually ended up changing the title of it to seven surprising facts around posture instead of just seven facts around posture, because I found patients would just look at it and they go, oh yeah, I know all that posture stuff. I'm, I'm already know about sitting up straight and it's like, no, no, have another look at it because actually that's not well supported um, by the research and that's not what this infographic is saying. So um, yeah. yeah, thank you again for your time. Do you guys have any closing remarks? No, oh, just to uh, thank you, Kim, for the for arranging this, but also for all your help with the infographics. If it was left to me, there would be no infographics. Yeah. So thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks, guys. There you have it, the end of another episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Let us know what you thought of the conversation by getting in contact via EBP podcast on social media. Did you agree, disagree? Were there any other points that you thought we missed or want discussed? Resources, the vodcast, script, infographic, and references can be found at the show notes page at www.bodylogic.physio forward slash podcast. But until next time, remember to ask, is there more to pain than damage? Please note, what you heard on this episode of Empowered Beyond Pain is strictly for information purposes only and does not substitute personalised, high-value care from a licensed and trusted healthcare practitioner. We are all individuals and need to be assessed and managed as such. Theme music generously provided by Fervin and Cash. <laughs>